Oh, I want to get on that Eurostar after this meeting. I miss Paris so much. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose you do. You've been a bit Anthony, haven't you, to Paris in your day? Yeah, yeah, as well. I mean, I used to live in Belgium as well, so we used to mm. go around Europe. Wow, I feel oh, very... So you must speak French too. Uh, it's definitely not what it was, but yeah, I, <laughs> I did speak a bit of French previously. Less now, mm. a lot less now. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So look, um, thank you. Uh, again, and 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 we're going to talk about Edda, which is your beautiful business you founded. But um, first of all, um, as is always the case, and for our the context of listeners and watchers, because we do get quite a few people viewing the podcast, so obviously love to see my beautiful but cold face in London uh, at the moment. We are very having a very cold spell. It's a reference point. 18th 19th of january i think i can't remember which today. day okay yep yeah. so for people who are listening that's captain's log um you know we are shivering away in london um mm -hmm. and you know as we like to find out the background to to the businesses it's always good to sort of get a bit on Clement, uh your your previous life before edda why you had the the light bulb moment to create edda well um thank you first of all thank you very much for having me um and yeah so i would try to to answer this question and i will try to make it short um yes. because the before edda things were a little bit more complex um so yeah so, so the story, and this is also what makes Ada a bit different, I think, is uh, we, so Ada is, is a software for, for private equity investors. And what I mean by private equity is, is every people who are basically buying equities that are not public. So it's including VC, corporate venture, family OC, offices, investment bank, and everything. Um, yeah, but the thing is, usually people who are building companies in, this area are, are usually coming from a financial background and from pure financial background, um, which is not or the case of the funding team of EDA. So before everything, we, we learned design at school and design and technology, and we were not um, supposed to lend into this area. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we really wanted to be to be entrepreneur and, um, and to build something, building a product and, and, and changing the way people work or people live. Um, and the thing is, when you go at school, people usually um, teach you, you know, what is, it, um, what is a company or how to build a product or how to, how to you know, to build different, I mean, companies or, 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 or things like this. But no one really teach you how to raise money. Um, and usually if you want to build a, a, a big technology company, you will probably need to raise a little bit of money. That could be very helpful. So in part of my school, I decided to go into many different currencies conference investors um, and um, and to understand a little bit better um, how they think, what they're looking for, um, and how they invest and everything, and they, what, what makes them exciting, right? Um, and so I had a chance to go in a conference called Le Web in Paris. That was one of the biggest conferences at that time. And Louis, I was very... Louis, I heard of Loïc Lemieux. Loïc Lemieux, oui, yeah. Yeah, I know Loïc. Yeah. Yes, I had been to the bed. I, uh, yeah. funnily enough, it was um, 2012, 2013. And oh, I actually, so we, I met, so we, uh, we met already. I met Instagram there uh, when mm. they like a startup, which was yeah. quite crazy. Um, so <laughs> anyhow, okay. yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that was a very, very interesting uh, conference, and mm. I was I was lucky enough to to meet um, Fabrice Guinda. Um, so I don't know if you if you if you know a little bit uh, Fabrice, but uh, but he, he was uh, I mean he's still uh, one of the most active investors on the planet, investing a lot. Um, and um, and yeah, at that time he had already 130 companies in this portfolio and everything. So so for me as a as a student, uh, first year student, that was incredible to to meet him. And we had a very nice conversation. And then I decided to publish an article um, about about this conversation. And and we had quite a lot of a success as a success for that time at least mm -hmm. and we decided to keep in touch um and then I, I really wanted to go to work for a company in new york i fell in love with new york um 
So I asked Fabrice if he can maybe help me to to find an internship at that time. That was that was a very long time ago. Now it's like ten years ago. I'm getting old, you know. And um, and he... <laughs> you are, aren't we all? I'm old. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and and basically he offered me to to work for a company called Rebag. Um, so it's a it's a marketplace of luxury and bag in New York, and and that was that was really great time. So I spent uh, I spent a few months in New York working for Rebag, and then. I had to go back to Paris to keep continue uh, my school. Uh, so I was working during the morning and beginning of afternoon for my school, and then during the afternoon and late evening for Rebag. And after six months, Fabrice, Fabrice called me back and he said, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a new project. I want to build a fund. I want to build a venture firm. And, um, and I don't know what we should do together, but I think I need some um, profile like you. So if you want to join, I'll be very happy to. Um, so yeah, and so I, I I was like, of course, uh, of course I want to join the adventure. So then I was working during the morning for my school, and then during the afternoon for a rebag, and then during the evening and the night mm -hmm. for FG Lab. So my schedule started to be a little bit complex, but that was really interesting time. So I was able to travel a lot, to meet founders everywhere, and to become like a small VC. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, small investors, but the thing that was also very interesting is uh, I was in charge of managing our investment. And so, especially at that time, um, the, let's say the software on the market was like very big software built for private equities, you know, with with 20 years of tech legacy built by engineers for engineers, when you need a, a huge team to be able to manage it, you need six months to onboard on the product. And, and we were like a, a team of uh, five or six people and uh, deploying 50 million per year in an order of investment. So of course we didn't have any chance and, and we just not the resources and not the time to, to work and to onboard on that kind of solutions. So Fabrice called me in the middle of the night, as usual, let's say. And, and he told me that we can't uh, we can't keep continuing using this spreadsheet because the spreadsheet was, um, let's say we moved from 100 lines to 300 lines with yeah. like 50 different tabs. You were was very complex the spreadsheet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and the, 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 the spreadsheet was just exploding. So, so it just, it just I mean, that was a five minute call actually. And it just said, uh, okay, so just try to put this spreadsheet in cloud. And I would love to be able to, to add an investment in one click and to create a new fund in one click. And that's it, build your team and do whatever you want. I was like, okay. And because I'm coming from a product background, I, I always prefer to work on products than to work as a VC, even if it's a very interesting job, but, but I prefer to build stuff. Um, so I was okay. Uh, let, let's do the let's do this. And so I built a team of seven people. I bring some some people that are now my co-founder, and um, and yeah. So we bring a team of seven people who work during one year on the on the product. And after one year, I call Fabrice back and for call the team back uh, with the different partners. And I just say that now we got a product. Uh, I'm very happy with the first version. We got a team, and you are a fan. So maybe we can do something together, and mm -hmm. this is how we raise our first round, and we launch, uh, we launch Eda. Yeah. So, so that's Eda the story. Is, Eda is a spin out from a fund. Yeah, exactly. So Money. the thing that was an internal tool. The premise, if you want to have a good tool, uh, you can't keep five engineers in the back of your office um, and build a small team and invest a little bit of money. So if you really want to build a great product, now we got thirty people who dedicated their life um, to this product and, and we still have a lot of things to do mm. and we still need to grow the team and everything so so if you want to build a very good product you actually need more resources and more time so that's why we decided to turn into a company and uh, and that was a good experience yeah very happy about this decision <laughs> still happy <laughs> and the, the rest is history as they say but um no that's an amazing start um so i suppose you know add, adding the next level um and looking more at where edda is now uh, as a business mm -hmm. um it, it, it i i believe it's taken v you've taken vc investment you you've grown the business if you could perhaps sort of give us a sort of nuts and bolts of why edda is so successful what it effectively does and and who i i suppose always oh, good who are your customers um, you know, is it a two-sided type of uh, business? There's, there's uh, many revenue streams. So it'd be great to understand more. The GP are what we call general partners. So it's people who usually 
build fund. Um, so usually they are VCs. So that means they invest in um, uh, private technology companies at early stage um, or later stage, but actually usually it's pretty young company compared to public companies, right? Um, yeah, and, and so so the first thing is um, they receive a lot of different opportunities for, for investment every year. Um, for example, at FG Labs, we were receiving around 5,000 companies per year, but of course you won't necessarily invest into 5,000 companies. Mm. Um, so you need to uh, work and you need to read a lot of um, documents and everything. You need to synchronize a lot of information and to work with your team to decide in which company uh, you're going to invest. Um, so yeah, so the first tool I have them to do that, so to work together and to take the best decision as possible. And also to have a lot of statistics about how many companies they've seen during the year, um, where, where they're coming from, what is the market they're looking at and everything. And then once you decide to invest, uh, everything flows to another tool that's called the portfolio management. So it's actually where you will manage your relationships, um, with the different companies uh, that you decided to invest in. Um, so on the portfolio, we have them to track how much they invest, where, um, at which valuations, uh, and also to reopen a, an access for the founders of the company that can get access to the space and update their different information, update their different metrics, and also ask for some help sometimes. Um, and, uh, and, and then at the end, they can do some reporting, um, and to track the different performances and yeah. also, um, to generate what we call LPs reports. So LPs is investor who are investing in usually VC firms that are mm -hmm. investing in startups. So, so the money is always coming from somewhere. So yeah. the VC are raising money from what we call limited partners, which is LP. And so they can also do some report uh, to the LPs and synchronize everything. And yeah, so this is what we do. And today we, we so, work so in... in effect, my, my background, uh, one of my background uh, places I worked was Bloomberg so you oh, yeah. in your the Bloomberg for VC it's that's a very good metaphor uh this is exactly what we're trying to do uh we we're building the we say sometimes that we're building the Bloomberg of the private equity yeah mm. but also it has some practical functions like it's a CRM as well it's integrated yeah. into your email for all the tracking all that sort of stuff uh it's so for instance, even on the portfolio management, you know, sometimes you get an email with the monthly update or something. So you're just mm -hmm. telling the portfolio company to log in and put their monthly update in there and then, you know, kind of streamlining a lot of those processes, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. And we also synchronize with a lot of tools that people are using. So, for example, we also synchronize with database such as Crunchbase or PitchBook mm -hmm. to every time capture the public information and sometimes also update the information about the companies. But we also synchronize with the different emails, um, um, you know, email systems that people use uh, with Dropbox, for example, mm -hmm. to synchronize documents and calendar tasks. So it's what we try to do is we to create kind of magic experience so for example if you receive an email um for an investment opportunity the system will automatically capture all the public information about the company capture the contact synchronize your contact synchronize every email that you and your team already exchanged with this company synchronize all the documents so that means in one single click you already have access to all the public information about the company and also a lot of private information that are coming from emails and, um, yeah. and documents that you already have so then on the deal flow side, um, because I think it's always an interesting topic of how do you manage scale, right? And getting 5,000 pitches a year, I would say that's oh. definitely qualified to scale. How automated is the deal flow process with your tool? If somebody sends a pitch deck, does it sort of, you know, uh, take the text, upload it, put it into different buckets, that sort of thing? Or, you know, how, how does that look on the on the data on the yeah. data management side yeah so, so the first thing is as i said we, we try to synchronize and to capture as many informations uh, as possible because you take decision um based on you know the information that you have yeah. and the more you have information technically better will be the decision and you don't um, want to miss something hopefully. as well right if something's yeah. perfect for your investment thesis but because it's one of five thousand pitches you might miss it right yeah and and you will miss it i mean we we, we try to <laughs> We try to help you as much as possible. We try to to 
you know, um, to to do our best. But but of course, with five thousand pitches per year, you you can't you can't scan everything properly. And uh, mm. and you know, there is some very good fund with a very good anti portfolio who show that they they decided to don't invest into such a big companies right now and and, and did some mistakes, even if they are very good fund. Mm. Um, so this is the sad part of the VC story. <laughs> um, but yeah, so 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 then. I think, uh, so we, we, for example, we synchronize with a lot of tools they're using uh, with the calendar so they can pre-set up some tasks and all those different tasks will be automatically synchronized with the calendar. So by this way, uh, let's say they, they're sure that they will never forget to do something or to recontact someone. Uh, they can also send an email, put a reminder. So sometimes the company is a bit too early, for example. So we also synchronize all those different reminders uh, with the different calendars and with the different tools um, uh, they already use. So, so yeah, and then our vision is um, you should, you should, we should be able to work more collaboratively, and and the, the best way would be to bring as many people as possible. So, so for example, you can you can invite all your team, but you can also invite external contact. Um, that can get access to your deal flow and help you to to make the selections. And then there is of course different stages, and on the different stages you can put different criteria, and so that also helps you to make sure that the companies at the end of the pipeline fit every criteria that you have. Mm. Mm, yeah, this is this is what we do, and then of course we try to automate the the, the hardest part, which is capturing information. Are you at the point where you 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 you've reached maximum scale? Are you halfway down that road? Uh, uh, you know, are you twenty customers um, that pay the majority of your revenues? H- how's your own scale? Um, and that journey being with the business. Yeah. Um, so today we, we are working with 120 funds uh, and we are in 26 countries. So we are very international. Um, and this is also what I wanted to show before the last funding round that we just closed. It, I wanted to show to our investors that the needs are the same everywhere in the world, mm-hmm. no matter the size of the fund and no matter the geography. And that's the case. So today we're working, as I said, with with VC, CVC, and uh, but an investment bank, family offices, incubator, um, and and yeah. So for example, the smallest fund is is something around five million, I think, as in management, and the biggest one is twenty one billion, and they're all using the same software. And yeah, and and sometimes when I speak, so you must people, have a pretty you must have a pretty sizable dev team there, Clement. It's very flexible, yeah. But is is it a big team? Obviously, very big. Oh, sorry. The the team is is thirty people right now. Okay, that's not yeah, bad. not that big. Okay. Yeah, we we are hiring. Many, if I can uh, just say, hiring twenty people hiring? right now. Okay, everyone who's listening and watching, we will distribute <laughs> uh, Clement's details after the call. Sure. <laughs> and that's that's great. You're hiring. I mean, and and you mentioned the round. What you closed a round? Was that a Series A, B, or or what? What's that? We we didn't publish the stage, uh, but we we closed five point eight million. So some people call that Series A. Some people call that the big seed. Uh, Depends where you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's Depends all... where you are machinations okay changing tack slightly um there has been a lot of dry powder sat on the sidelines over the last 12 to 18 months to two years Mm -hmm. some people are suggesting that it could be the first scenario which is the four s's i mentioned of, of doom and gloom or alternatively the dry powder could start to move back into the market um, around Q2 and, and accelerate into into Q3 and Q4. But mm-hmm. hypothesis, people obviously at this time of the year try and predict. I just wondered what, what your thoughts are on, on where we are in the private markets. There is, there is some a sentence that we use at, at EDA is uh, um, you, you can't really predict the future uh, based on the past, right? <laughs> so, um, what I can say is, so, so first of all, I, um, I'm not aware about what's happening on the software at all. So uh, it will be only my opinion. So it won't be based on on data, um, and it's only about what I the different conversation that I had and I, and also what I seen in the press. Um, I'm not I'm not very good at at making predictions, but what I can say is, of course. Um, things won't be uh, as crazy as it used to be in 2020 and 2021, because I think 
we at that time we reached out a point that was a little bit too much uh, for everyone and that was not good and not healthy yeah for <laughs> yeah not not, not yeah. even good for for companies i think um so so we know for example that i i read a very interesting article um into i think that was a business insider who, who published something about you know the, the point is when you when you are vc and when you invest into late stage um and um and for example with companies that will raise uh, for a billion dollar valuations there is there is probably if you invest, for example, in fintech in Europe, there is not a lot of different companies where you can invest in. At least at the end of the of the course, there is only a few companies. Um, so I know that there is a lot of CEO who decided to say, okay, so we're going to raise at a hundred times the revenue for the valuation and not less. So the thing is, if you are a VC and you need to deploy your capital, so then if every company that you contact will uh, give you the, a price at a hundred times the revenue, yeah. They're so colluding then, course, to do price fixing. <laughs> exactly. That's interesting. And um, and so so that was that was crazy high. And the thing is, there is a lot of CEO who decided also to exceed their shares. So right now we are in a very bad position where there is CEO who doesn't own any percentage of the company anymore. And of course, the valuation goes down because uh, not the time the revenue is actually kind of crazy. You know, the average is like seven times the revenue, so like more than ten times more. Um, they raised and sold out at the peak of the market. So what's yeah. left in a lot of these businesses is the crumbs and a tenth of the value, if that. Yeah. Exactly. So so I, th I think I think this year will be more reasonable. Uh, also because uh, this kind of mistake, let's say, uh, costs a lot of money to funds. So they will be less, um, you know, uh, inclined to invest at, at crazy valuations. Uh, so of course, I think the first thing is the valuation will, will go down, um, and that's that's something more reasonable. And the thing is, raising at a high level of of um, very high valuation is not necessarily healthy for the company, um, because if you if you raise mindless. at a high level of valuation, sorry, it's a mind, it's a mindless exercise. You should what? you should always raise a valuation that you can build a business on. High, no. yeah. high valuations, high expectations, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. To fail. yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, so I think I think things will be more reasonable. But what I can see also clearly is, uh, and this is based on a lot of different, uh, you know, interview and and um, and and podcasts that I that I was listening is. I think there is a very important, and I think you were talking about this during the the previous episode. Um, there is something that is clearly moving into into what we call sustainability um, and gender equality, inclusions, and everything. And there is finally a very big trend of entrepreneur, and this is what we said at at Eda that we're probably living a kind of new renaissance in a way, in the sense that uh, during a long time, a lot of different topics such as health or, or space exploration or or you know energy was only topic that only government or states were taking care of. And now you can see this new generation of entrepreneurs who say, actually, uh, the, the states are not moving fast enough, the government are not doing enough things. So we decided to build companies that are actually solving those problems. Mm. And it's actually mm -hmm. a bit scary sometimes, but also very, very interesting to see all this new generation of entrepreneurs that are building new things to absolutely make the world better and not only delivering food in 15 minutes instead of 20. Um, mm. and, and I'm very happy about that to see uh, mm. to see this new this new generation of things. So, so I think uh, I also had a discussion with a, with a fund recently, and they said that uh, because they are raising a new, let's say, impact fund, and, and raising a fund uh, with, a, let's say, something impactful inside and who wants to invest into in, in, uh, yeah, companies that are doing impact, uh, will probably raise a little bit easier. And that's why now we are launching into a software. We are working this year to launch into the software to calculate the impact of the fund mm -hmm. uh, around three main pillars, uh, which is gender equality, uh, diversity inclusion, and climate change. Thanks for the, the perspectives on the, the the private market slum. Really, really um, insightful. Um, you know, you're there. You're in the thick of it. Is 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 the French tech scene? still alive kicking growing really fast easy to hire talent you know all the usual things that as you look out to the year ahead you you look with excitement and encouragement 
Yeah, I, I think I think friends. So I'm in the tech since ten years now. Um, so I, I started to really dig into uh, tech in France since like yeah, 2012 something. And I can see that I, I can tell you that actually things change a lot, um, and very fast. And there is more and more initiative, more and more talented people. I think also there is something interesting. There is a good momentum from France right now because. It seems like the American dream is a little bit over now. Um, when you speak with people, there is more American people who want to come to live in Europe than actually European people who wants to come in, in to go in New York or San Francisco. And uh, I, I was in New York uh, last summer, and you know, before the COVID, you were really feeling something in this city. I don't know. I don't know if you. I don't know if you feel the same, but but. But, you know, you had a kind of very strong energy. And when I went back uh, this summer after COVID, you don't, you don't feel that anymore. I mean, that was not my case. So that's why I was speaking with a lot of uh, investors there. And, uh, and I think, yeah, the American dream is a little bit over. And, um, and people are less and less interested by, by moving to, into San Francisco and, and building the Californian uh, yeah. cliche startups. But it's like um, you, you don't have to now go to America to scale a global yeah. business. It's yeah, very... you you can do a billion dollar company everywhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um and because of the Brexit of the UK, uh, so it it I think it will be a bit more complex. So now, for example, we have a lot of um, of of people that apply at EDA and uh, and they have issue because, for example, they can't go with a European passport. They can't necessarily go to work in the UK, so they need to do a visa and everything where they don't need anything to come to work in France. And Paris is also close to London, so you can travel for the weekend and everything so there is a lot of people who are kind of yeah very interesting to move in paris and i think germany also is a little bit so far and what i'm seeing is they are a little bit less uh let's say interested by technology they used to be to be very strong in in at building tech companies but it seems like it's a little bit less the case right now i don't know but we hear a little bit less about german companies I think there is <laughs> So I think I think there is something that happening in France right now, and especially with uh, you, you were talking about Ox and Varza. So, uh, mm-hmm. for example, we spent uh, we spent more than two years in Station F, and that, that's a fantastic place. Um, that was absolutely amazing as a as a as a entrepreneur to to join this very big initiative. So maybe for our listener, uh, Station F is a is a very big startup campus in Paris. Um, it's it's actually crazy huge. There is more than one thousand startups into the campus. So it's very very big. But there is basically three different uh, buildings that are linked together. And so on the first one, you can see there is a VC. There is a lot of VCs that are coming. Um, but there is also all the French administration. So as an entrepreneur, you can, you can see every, every French administration paying your taxes, do, doing everything, um, and everything in the same building. So it's actually very convenient. And then there is one building with a thousand companies with, I think, 42 different programs. Um, which is which is very great because you can also see companies with different stages. You can meet a lot of entrepreneurs, and then on the last uh, part, there is a very big restaurant when you can invite people, invite your clients, invite external people, and 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 everything. So so yeah, so it's actually it's actually very very interesting place, and it, it brings a lot of people. So you can see. As in the morning, you, you go at your, at your desk and then you see Brian Chesky from Airbnb that just come to give a, a small conferences. Then you see a lot of black cars that are coming. It's actually the, the, the first, the prime minister of, of Korea that is coming. And then there is a CEO of Microsoft and, and the, the CEO of Square and Twitter that are coming to give some conferences and, and advice to different companies and a lot of investors. And you see Xavier Niel in the, in the corridor. So, so it's, it's creating a lot of opportunities and there is more and more places like this in Paris, in Quebec, more and more VCs raising more and more money. So I think, and the, the French uh, government helped definitely quite a lot with the French tech initiative, for example, which is very nice. Um, but also with some other initiatives that are less known, um, let's say outside of France, for example, BPI, which is a, uh, 20, I think they've got 21 billion uh, asset under management, investing more than 450 uh, VC in Europe and investing in a lot of companies. That is a public investment bank that invests in startups, which is, I, I don't think it's the case in every country. So yeah. all those different initiatives combined uh, create a very good and powerful ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, the French government also seems to do a very good job of getting corporates involved as well in yeah. early stage investing where... It's not always the case in a lot of a lot of countries. Yeah, yeah, I think, true. 
I think, you know, I would add that I think the UK, unless we sort out our approach at a government level to all the new technologies and and they've really put some serious finance behind mm-hmm. what what we have, our lead is going to be eroded relatively quickly by countries like like France. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's fair to say we're, we're standing still at the moment I, I, in terms of government initiatives. I mean, all they seem to focus on is EIS and SEIS, which, you know, it's the, the mechanism of investment, which, you know, we need billions pumped into this industry, just like your great uh, Mr. Macron has done for, for the French ecosystem. If we were to do this podcast again in 12 months, um, what would you have hoped to have achieved? Interesting. Uh, I think we can we can start by going back to one of the previous questions that, that I didn't have a chance to answer. Is you asked me where we are in our, in our journey, right? In, mm. So I, I consider that we did less than one percent of our potential. Um, so 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 we 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 are we really want to grow uh, and we want to grow very very fast. Um, and yeah, because I think there is there is a space right now for there is no leader in our area. So if you if you look at the public market, there is Bloomberg, right? And Bloomberg, they I think they're doing something about ten billion dollar a year of revenue for a valuation of something around seventy billions. Um, so now if you look at the private equity market, which is now bigger than the public equity market, a lot of people know that, but actually there is, there is more and more companies, uh, that are, that are private and, and want to stay private. Uh, the returns are now seven times higher in private equity than in public equity market. We estimate around 10 trillion asset under management in the world for the private equity market. And it is growing between 12 and 20% per year. And we estimate that it's going to reach at around 18 trillion in 2030. So this market is booming, it's growing very, very fast, and there is definitely a lot of money that is flowing there. Um, so, so, but the thing is, if you look at the companies that are in those areas, they are still pretty small. So I think the biggest one is something, is Carta probably, um, and, and the valuation of Carta is, is no, more, no more than two billions. I think it's between one and five billions. I don't, I don't, I don't have the, the last, uh, the last numbers. Um, and and if you look at, for example, the, the, the company that are doing the portfolio management um, in our area, so there is no no dynamic company. So the only companies that are there are like Dinosaur that have been all acquired. So Ifont, for example, which is a European company with 800 clients, have been acquired for 1.3 billion in 2019 by BlackRock. And same thing in the US with Aprio, who have been acquired by HS Market for 1.9 billion. Um, so, so yeah, so there is no very big, no dynamic companies. Um, and there is a, there is a space for leader because there is, we should have the Bloomberg of the private equity. And, and because, because this market is booming, we need more structure. We need more technology. We need to organize things better. I mean, if you look at the capable of companies, I mean, our biggest competitor is still Excel. So people keep continue managing hundred millions or billions on Excel. And, um, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's just, not possible to keep continuing like this. So of course we will need the software to manage all the different assets, especially if we almost double the size of the market in the next 10 years. So, so we think that there is a space for us. Uh, we think that we are in a very good position also because we're doing this all-in-one solution that people expect. Of course, we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of people to convince, um, but but I think there is a way. So, so our vision will be, yeah, to... I, I'm, I'm not going to give you some numbers and very precise no, numbers no, but no, basically no, because no, i, I no, don't no, think that no, makes no. sense yeah and we we are still uh, still at the beginning yeah. but but yeah so so our, our point would be at least to double or triple the size of the company during this year yeah I, I, actually i think we can we can double for sure yeah well i mean look it, it sounds very exciting it sounds like you've got the world is your oyster as they say um you know, and I, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Clement. Um, it's been fascinating uh, to learn more about you, the business. I will thank you, Clement. Um, thank you very much. We will, we will weekend and thank you, Anthony. <laughs> and I will see you maybe in Paris. In Yeah. Paris. Au revoir. With pleasure. Thank uh, you for uh, your uh, question. Uh, I'll have a good weekend.